Hi, good afternoon. Uh, we probably still have a few people straggling in, but I wanted to get started. Um, we are very excited. We want to welcome you all to the Baker Institute. Um, this, is, this program is part of a new program, uh, which we'll talk about in a moment. Uh, but I just wanted to give you a little background on the sponsoring institutions. I'm Amy Jaffe. I am the Associate Director for the Rice Energy Program, which is a joint venture between the James Baker Institute for Public Policy and um, something called EASY, the uh, Environmental and Energy Systems Institute. Uh, and we look broadly at um, the role of technology and science policy and its impact on issues related to energy and the environment. Um, and uh, with this program was also uh, supported by the Shell Center for Sustainability and the Program for the Study of Women and Gender at Rice. So we're really very excited to form a broader partnership across the campus to look at uh, issues related to energy and gender. Um, the Baker Institute Energy Forum is, uh, has been around for almost nine years. Uh, we're industry supported. We also get uh, grants from foundations and um, other kinds of organizations. We do a, most of our work traditionally has been in the area of energy policy, oil geopolitics. Uh, we did a big program last year with Stanford on the geopolitics of natural gas. Uh, we are embarking now over the next two years uh, on a study on the role of the national oil company in the international energy market. So we do sort of a broad range of things. We also have a big program on energy and nanotechnology together with uh, our Center for Nanoscale Science. And uh, I'm going to ask uh, Jaleen Connors, uh, one of our, our researchers at the Baker Institute, to come and talk to us a little bit briefly about uh, the program on energy agenda, and then she'll introduce our speaker. Good afternoon. Uh, as Amy said, my name is Jaleen Connors, and I'm a research associate in the Energy Forum here. And we've recently begun a program called Gender, Energy, and Society, which aims to investigate the energy dimension of poverty and development with gender considerations. Worldwide, more than 2 billion people lack access to sustainable and modern energy services. Without access to basic energy for lighting, cooking, heating, transportation, and other productive purposes, people, and most often women, are forced to spend the majority of their time and physical energy on subsistence activities. Lack of energy services can be correlated with the major elements of poverty, including inadequate health care, low education levels, and limited, limited employment opportunities. As 2005 marks the 10-year anniversary of Beijing's Fourth World Conference on Women, the timing is perfect to reflect on the progress made since Beijing and the challenges that still remain. This lecture series, which is sponsored by the Baker Institute, Rice's Program for the Study of Women and Gender, and the Shell Center for Sustainability, is an opportunity to draw attention to issues relating to gender, poverty, and economic development within international policy debates. By bringing together social scientists, industry experts, economists, non-governmental agencies, and policymakers, we hope to better forge an understanding of the synergies and trade-offs among the three main dimensions of sustainable development, namely economic efficiency, environmental sustainability, and social equity. Our first speaker, Ms. Susan McDade, is the manager of sustainable energy program at the United Nations Development Program in New York. Since 1996, she has worked on the definition of UNDP's overall program approach and policy framework, linking energy activities to sustainable development as reflected in corporate publications as well as country-level program activities. From 1990 to 1996, Ms. McDade worked in UNDP country offices in Guatemala and China, managing capacity-building activities in the social sectors and in energy and environment. The upcoming Commission for, Sustain for Sustainable Development, CSD 14 and 15, which will take place in 2006-2007, will actually focus on energy, which is extremely important in the international context. Ms. McDade is, has, is a development economist with a Master's of Development Studies in Economic Policy and Planning from the Institute of Social Studies in Netherlands. And among other things, Ms. McDade will be speaking about the themes and policy recommendations presented in the recently released report, Gender and Energy for Sustainable Development, a Toolkit and Resource Guide, which is jointly produced by UNDP and Energia. 
The toolkit was designed for use by development practitioners, energy planners, community groups, and gender experts on ways to address energy issues at the international and policy levels. The tools presented in the guidebook have been designed to help development practitioners and energy planners ask the relevant questions needed to bring about better development and energy outcomes that are gender specific and that address the needs of women in particular. Please join me in welcoming Susan McDade. Thanks very much, Delaine, and, and thank you um, to Rice University and the Baker Institute for the uh, invitation to come and give this presentation. Um, I had the, uh, the dubious pleasure of actually living and being in China uh, 10 years ago during the uh, Fourth World Conference on Women, and I say dubious because if you were a UN staff member, that was like running a military operation because that was at that time the largest UN conference we had ever had. But the substance of the conference certainly focused on uh, gender equity, uh, right to resources, and uh, issues of gender empowerment in relation to development overall. Um, before starting this presentation, which will look specifically at gender and energy issues, I just wanted to say a little bit about what is UNDP, because um, it's possible that not everybody has an understanding of that. Uh, the United Nations system is uh, composed of agencies and programs that look at various issues that the UN takes care of, like peace and security, economic development, refugees, women, children, um, uh, political rights, etc. UNDP, the United Nations Development Program, is sort of like the front office of the UN system in every developing country in the world. So we are present in 136 developing countries, and you could think of UNDP like the embassy of the United Nations system in all developing countries. Um, we're the largest source of grant-based uh, technical assistance or foreign aid from the UN system to developing countries. And like sister agencies such as UNICEF or the World Health Program or um, the United Nations Fund for Population Activities, work directly with government and civil society counterparts in developing countries to provide uh, project-based technical assistance to look at um, various development bottlenecks. UNDP in particular focuses on issues related to governance and public policy, uh, poverty reduction and social equity, and then there's a whole program area on energy and environment. It's within that third <coughs> program area that I work. Uh, we also have uh, major programs of assistance on HIV um, reduction and uh, management of the HIV pandemic, as well as crisis prevention and recovery. So uh, when you hear about tsunami relief um, and UN system coordination uh, in the Asia Pacific region right now, that's usually UNDP and the resident representative of the United Nations who uh, coordinates that. So previous to my assignment in New York, uh, I've spent about half of my UN career working at the country level and half in New York, which means flying around on airplanes and being every place except New York. I was in Morocco last week working on energy issues. Um, but I think uh, this preface is to just give you a sense that UNDP is uh, a globally based organization. We have a very large portfolio on energy programs. We have over 2,000 energy projects worldwide um, and have, you know, 80% of our country offices do work on energy. So this is quite a mainstreamed issue for UNDP. And you might say, well, why gender and energy? Um, one of the things that we'll see from this presentation is even if one did not care about justice or gender equity or the rights of women, in, especially in the rural context, it is in fact just impossible to have energy outcomes that support economic growth and sustainable development without addressing the role of women because they have such a particular role in the provision, transportation and utilization of energy services. So. Um, even if one didn't care about an equity-based approach from a purely utilitarian um, objective, one needs to think about the role of women in particular in um, energy service provision at, in developing countries. Um, the overview of my presentation is I'd like to talk a little bit about um, gender and energy and some of the conceptual relationships. Uh, then to pull it down to reality, I'm going to talk about uh, one particular project that operates in West Africa, which is the Mali Multifunction Platform. And then uh, the toolkit, uh, which was mentioned in the introduction, I'll talk about some of the specific uh, policy recommendations of the toolkit. 
Um, this is what the toolkit looks like. It's available on our website and the links uh, will be mentioned in this presentation. Um, and that and other resources that UNDP works on um, are certainly available publicly. Uh, the two main publications on gender and energy in specific that I would mention is this toolkit and then an earlier publication that's called Generating Opportunities, which is a series of eight case studies that looks at um, specific uh, projects and programs uh, that looked at gender and energy and the specific uh, outcomes uh, that did or did not make those projects successful. And I say did or did not make because, um, in fact, in this field, gender and energy, we are actually able to learn just about as much from bad projects as from good projects because most development projects in the energy field have approached um, energy as a gender uh, neutral topic where that's in fact incorrect um, and projects that have taken that approach have quite often failed. Um, so I would start with my overview of why energy matters. Um, Jilin talked a little bit about um, the concept of sustainable development. I think everybody has heard of the Rio conference in 1992 where the concept of sustainable development that talked about the economic, social and environmental <laughs> aspects of development uh, came to the international fore. And energy as a topic is um, very pertinent to all three issues. Depending where you sit or what you work on, some people will focus more on the environmental aspects or more on the economic aspects or more on the social aspects, but energy as a topic impacts all three so-called pillars of sustainable development. Um, from an economic point of view, we could put up the um, GNP growth uh, chart of any country in the world and show how energy consumption basically moves in lockstep. For a long time, that was thought to be a fixed pattern that you needed an exact increase in energy to get an exact increase in GDP. Uh, in the case of China, we've seen that that's not necessarily so with increases in energy efficiency. They can both move in the same direction but not necessarily at the same rate. But there's no country that you can put a graph up for increases in GDP growth without increases in energy. So that would be my main point on the economic front. That energy is an essential input to economic growth and the poorest countries which have the fewest energy, commercial energy resources are also the most constrained economically. From an environmental point of view, um, certainly if you live in the developed countries, um, among which we're sitting right now, one of the key environmental issues you'll hear about the most is global climate change. 80% um, of all um, global greenhouse gas emissions come from the energy sector. But if you're sitting in a developing country, um, frankly, climate change would not be on the top of your list of environmental concerns. But issues related to uh, local pollution, um, acid rain, land degradation, loss of forest cover, and indoor air pollution, especially the health effects from poorly ventilated stoves and traditional means of cooking, would be the main environmental aspects of energy that would impact your life. Um, on the social front, uh, two of the broad uh, parameters that we like to always start with is this two billion people number. Um, and there's really two distinct groups of two billion people. There is two billion people, so that's about a third of all humanity. The population of the planet is just crested over six billion a couple of years ago. So about a third of all people on the planet Earth have no access to commercial electricity. They can't turn on a light switch. Um, there's no grid that goes to their home. There's another group of people who are not exactly the same two billion, and it's even debatable if they're two billion or 2.4 billion, but again, a very big chunk of people. Um, that cook on traditional fuels like wood, agricultural residue, or animal dung for basic heating, water boiling, uh, and cooking. Um, and those, as I said, can be two different groups of people. So it's possible to be co connected to the grid and have an electric light bulb in your house but still be cooking on dung. And that is actually a condition of poverty um, in many, many places. Um, I think it's good before going into the specifics to get a global overview of how energy consumption is different in the north and the south. Um, developing countries uh, in net uh, consume about a sixth of what the developed countries in net consume. On a per capita basis, though, it can be a hundredth or one eight hundredth uh, compared to uh, northern countries. But what's most important in these two pie charts, um, and especially from a gender perspective as we're gonna go on to see, is in the developing country pie chart, the part that says biomass, 22%, versus industrialized countries, biomass, 4%. In the industrialized countries, 
the, basically the only places that are generating energy off of biomass, in most cases wood, would be um, Austria, Norway, and Canada a little bit in some decentralized places. Um, but biomass for developing countries as a group is about a quarter of all energy. And if you go to sub-Saharan Africa, for many countries, it's actually 90 to 95 percent of all energy. Um, that's significant because the technologies, policies, and approaches to provide energy um, in our countries, in the, in the rich countries, pretty much don't take biomass into account because we've gone past that stage of development by and large. Um, mostly we're not um, on a large scale heating homes with biomass energy. We're mostly not generating electricity with biomass. Um, in developing countries, you can still find aluminum factories being run off of um, basic uh, biomass and industrial scale kilns um, being run off of uh, wood, which is unthinkable in our own countries. Um, in both cases, what's important to see is that uh, fossil fuels are by far and large the grand majority of all energy consumption and trending forward even with expectations and increases in use in renewable energy. Uh, Fossil-based fuels and uh, conventional fuels remain very, very important for developing countries. Um, right now, this is gaining more international attention because of uh, fuel price increases, which are having a really um, basically devastating impact on the balance of payments for many of the poorest countries who are dependent on importing um, their uh, commercial energy in the form of uh, oil and gas. So very limited foreign exchange um, is being pressed even further um, in energy systems that are dependent on imported um, petroleum. Uh, I always like to have this slide because although it sounds very, very simple, um, in international energy, energy debate anywhere, this issue is pretty much always overlooked. From the point of view of the consumer, the energy source matters almost not at all. What do I mean? We are sitting in a room with illumination, with a computer that works, with a PowerPoint and a screen. Probably very few of us are sitting here wondering where did this electricity come from. We know that we have it and the electricity gives us illumination, communication, air conditioning and sort of a, some state of well-being. Um, we're probably not wondering about which part of the grid it came from, is it from out of state, is it from a coal-fired uh, station, is it from a modern clean coal, gas, wind, none of us are probably thinking about that. And in developing countries it's, it's not different. People are not sitting around wondering what is the source? They're wondering why, what is the service and why don't I have it? Why don't I have illumination? Why don't I have cooling? Why don't I have uh, communication from electricity? And from the point of view of the end user or the consumer in any country, what's important is the energy service. Um, so services are things like illumination, the heat for cooking or home heating, um, energy for mechanical power, such as pumping and grinding. Um, grinding refers to agricultural processing and food processing. Energy for transportation and communication and energy for business development and economic activities. Um, different services can come from different sources. That's to say you can have illumination from conventional or renewable energy. You can have mechanical power from a diesel engine or from grid-connected electricity. From the point of view of the consumer and as a development input, what matters is the availability and the affordability of the service and the source is secondary. From a development point of view, there's really two distinct challenges and um, I go to conferences all over the world, sit and listen to the same introductory statement which will talk about the two two billions. Two billion without electricity and two billions who cook on biomass. Then if the conference is five days, for five days I will only hear about electricity. Electricity generally will not provide the services for heating, cooking and uh, the heat related applications um, in developing countries. Mostly because unless you have a lot of really, really cheap hydro or really, really cheap something else, it's just not economically feasible to generate heat for large scale uh, cooking and heat applications from electricity. But from a, in development planning and in project development, most development assistance has focused pretty much just on the electricity side of things and quite inadequately on the fuel side of things. That has, has had and is still having a very distinct impact on gender and the inclusion of women um, in energy planning considerations. So electricity uh, is key for some services, uh, such as those mentioned here. 
But fuels, affordable fuels and cleaner fuels, are really essential for household uses, for productive purposes, which uh, involve heat-related applications. And when I say social, environmental, and economic benefits, I mean things like uh, boiled water, uh, health clinics um, that can do sterilization, um, and economic activities that involve heat. And I, having a, a distinct understanding of these two different sources is also very important when considering the situation in developing countries. Um, fuels for cooking are one of the most pressing issues in developing countries at large and one of the most direct uh, impacts on the condition of women. This picture is of a woman in South Asia in India um, cooking on uh, inside her house on a st traditional stove, um, actually not even as traditional as it can get. This one is kind of at least made out of um, concrete and adobe. Uh, but the condition of smoke, that's not just a bad photograph, that's what the inside of the house looks like because the smoke from that fire is basically unventilated and she and her children, all children under five, basically are going to be every day, several times a day, breathing that quality of air. Um, unfortunately, we don't like to trade in death statistics, but um, the mortality impact of ventil poorly ventilated stoves and indoor air pollution is in fact the fourth largest cause of death among people in developing countries. But it doesn't get the kind of attention that HIV or malaria or tuberculosis gets, but in fact on the list of main killers, it's number four um, in developing countries. And the World Health Organization has um, measured that uh, there's currently 1.6 million deaths annually that can be directly attributed to respiratory disease from indoor air pollution. The secondary effects are under debate, but the fact that a lot of people are basically needlessly dying um, because of reliance on traditional fuels and traditional check technology. It's not just that this woman is relying on traditional fuel, but that stove technology in the form of household construction is also clearly not helping the situation. Um, within the UN system and within the intergovernmental system looking at uh, development assistance. In the year 2000, there were a set of eight uh, global development priorities agreed, which are called the Millennium Development Goals. The five-year review of the Millennium Development Goals will happen this September. The Millennium Development Goals are quantifiable targets um, to reduce poverty, uh, illiteracy, to improve gender equity, etc., um, what these boxes say that have time-bound targets. So for instance, the first Millennium Development Goal says uh, reduce by half the number of people living on under a dollar a day by 2015. So they're time-bound quantifiable targets. And these set of targets right now are basically governing the aid flows in virtually all development assistance. Um, and the accountability for impact, quantifiable, measurable impact, is being governed by these eight goals. Now, what is um, sad and stunning is that among those eight goals, you do not see the word energy any place. There is no Millennium Development Goal on energy. Um, that was partly because at the time that um, these goals were framed, it was seen as sort of too tough to deal with. Um, various uh, debates still on, from the North-South divide about energy as a means versus an end. But what any development professional who works on energy can do is walk through each one of those goals and explain how without energy inputs, greatly increased quality and quantity of energy services, you actually can't reach any of those goals. So for instance, the first uh, millennium goal on eradicate extreme poverty and hunger. If poverty is correlated with income and economic opportunities are correlated with energy, you actually can't get more income generating activities without more energy inputs into the economy. Similarly, although this would seem like the most obvious thing in the world, the um, people who work on the hunger task force, who are basically nutritionists and um, agronomists, it had not occurred to them that 95% of all staple foods need to be cooked in order to turn into human nutrition. So rice, maize, yucca, anything that has a caloric value can't actually be turned into a benefit for humans unless it's cooked. None of us are eating raw rice or raw corn or any raw um, staples. And so to overcome extreme hunger, it actually wouldn't be enough to just increase the 
production of agricultural products and the, improve the distribution systems. Unless you have an increased ability to cook those foods, you won't actually decrease hunger. Um, similarly, reduce child mortality. Uh, one of the main causes of under five infection and disease and death is um, lack of access to boiled water. You can't boil water without energy. And another is uh, respiratory disease, the main cause of respiratory disease being those kind of traditional fires that I just showed you in the last slide. Um, for the purposes of this lecture, the third millennium to goal is promote gender equity and the empowerment of women. Um, in most developing countries, two of the main things that are really chaining women in rural areas to conditions of underdevelopment and poverty are lack of access to energy and water and the amount of time that women have to spend, not only women, but girl children, and I'll talk about that a little bit more, in carting around energy and water. Um, and so the idea that you're going to have gender equity or the same participation of girl children and boy children in school, unless the energy imbalance is dealt with, is just mythical. It, it will not occur. Um, so I, I'm spending the time mentioning this because the people who are working on the development agenda have prioritized these as the goals. But getting onto everybody's mind how energy is related to these goals has actually been a real uphill battle in the international development um, dialogue. So that was a little bit of just the energy and development overview. Gender and energy. Well, obviously, all people need energy services, not just women. Um, but the way that energy services are generated and used has a distinct impact on women and men. And the services that women and men use are different, and their role in producing the services is also different. Uh, women are, in, especially as I've mentioned in rural areas, responsible for the collection, transport, and generation of traditional energy. That 25 to 22 percent of the global pie chart, that's pretty much all female labor that's transporting that, um, combusting it. And um, in the cases that it's used for commercial activities, um, a lot of the sale of the products of commercial activity are also um, small enterprises that are managed by women. Um, these uh, slides I usually like to put up just to make a, a point that is <coughs> fairly simple. Many pictures of development and underdevelopment, including our own pictures on the cover of this book, will show people headloading wood or some kind of biomass that's going to be burned. The reason that people are carrying this biomass around in any developing country is because they need to produce heat. None of this is being transported because they need to produce light. Yet, when you look at development assistance and technology investments, most is going towards the production of light. If you are a poor person or a poor family, having light does not necessarily change anything about your economic status. It doesn't necessarily mean you have more income. It doesn't necessarily mean you have a different job. It certainly doesn't mean you're eating more or less. Um, and one of the basic needs every day for people is to have cooked food and boiled water. So you are never going to see a picture of somebody head-loading candles. And if you ever see it or find it, send it to me, because I've been looking for it for 15 years, and I haven't been able to find it. So one of the basic conditions that we take, a stereotype of underdevelopment, are these kind of pictures. And these kind of pictures exist because every day millions and millions, hundreds of millions of people, mostly women, are um, spending hours in some countries and some places, five and six hours a day, headloading wood um, to meet their basic um, energy needs, which is heat. Um, lack of access to energy affect men and women differently, and girls and women disproportionately. Um, this is in part because the gender division of labor in most places are such that it's a girl or female job to go collect wood. Um, obviously, there are also um, boys, and in some cases men, who collect wood, but many, 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 many times fewer than you'll ever see for women. And as fuel, traditional fuels become scarcer. If you are a poor family and you have to decide which of your kids you are going to employ or put to work um, carrying wood and take out of school in order to go carry wood, you're going to take the girls out of school. Why? Because the probability that in adulthood that somebody's going to take care of you, it's more likely going to be a son, and the income stream is more likely going to come from the son than the daughter. 
In a lot of cultures, not all, the daughter marries out of the family, whereas the daughter, mar daughter in law marries into the family. So, from a purely rational, economic, utility kind of thinking, families will withdraw girl children over boy children out of school to meet their um, fuel distribution needs as fuel becomes scarcer. This has a direct impact on um, girls' school participation and literacy. We know that more illiterate women have more children. So this has a direct impact um, on fertility and family size. We know that one of the best curbs to large families and one of the best forms of family planning is more educated women. Um, so this has a direct effect on the overall demographic imbalance. Uh, there's clear health effects and safety effects. If um, further and further you go, um, you're also more vulnerable to personal attack. We know that in conditions in refugee camps and um, You'll hear even about this kind of thing on CNN, um, that as uh, women in conditions of conflict and war have to go further and further afield to collect uh, wood and traditional fuels, it's one of the main forms of vulnerability of women to attack uh, and personal violence, um, directly related to energy scarcity. Um, and the uh, overall economic participation of women um, if you're spending five hours a day carting around wood, you're probably not having a lot of extra time left to do any income earning activities. Um, and if you're a girl and you start carting around wood like that from the time you're five or six, that frankly limits all of your opportunities in life looking down the road. So the availability of modern fuels and mechanical power are extremely important for uh, women. Uh, fuels, particularly for cooking, heating, boiling, and agricultural processing, and by that I mean um, anything that is a heat-related uh, input to the agricultural cycle. Roasting, drying, anything that is turning raw products um, into a semi-processed agricultural product, anything that's improving the value added of the agricultural products um, require a lot of heat inputs. Um, mechanical power is also extremely important because besides carting around um, wood on your head, one of the things that women and girls spend many, many hours doing is um, pounding and threshing uh, basic food and grain um, to turn it into uh, flour and semi-processed food for family consumption. Um, the sad thing is for both transport and mechanical power, um, as a good economist, if you go to um, evaluate a project, and if it is a donkey or a horse that is the transportation means or the, the animal that's running the thresher by, you know, walking around in circles, uh, you can actually attribute an economic value to the mule or to the horse, um, whereas generally the um, labor input of women and girls is considered as free or neutral, the, uh, the argument being that the opportunity cost is nothing. Um, and perhaps the only cost is the cost of the food to keep them alive. When you actually do the caloric balances, um, in some cases we can't actually even figure out how you're getting any positive caloric outcome because the amount of nutrition that the women take in compared to the energy um, that's being carted around um, hardly produces any surplus. Um, so the issue of uh, fuels for heat, mechanical power, which comes from electricity or from um, engines, and labor-saving devices are very, very important uh, to free up the time and to improve the physical quality of life for women and girls and to <coughs> enable girls to participate in school. And as we're going to see in a specific project, to enable women to have time to do activities which actually produce an income stream. Um, why is this important? Um, again, global evidence, completely forget about energy for a minute, is in any developing country, a, an additional dollar of income in the hands of a woman, especially if it's a female-headed household, which there are many, many female-headed households in developing countries, um, is spent disproportionately back on family welfare, education, and health compared to an additional dollar of income in the hands of men. I'm not making an anti-male statement. I'm making a statement that the utility that women see on additional income is a utility that gets reinvested back in school fees, in school uniforms, in food for the family, and in reinvestment back in family welfare. And the tendency to reinvest back in family welfare is not the same when you measure what happens to additional disposable income in the hands of men. Um, this is one of the reasons um, that microcredit um, has singled out women as their borrowers, um, partly because there's just different economic behaviors among the very poor. 
So from a gender and energy perspective, some of the key questions are first, who uses the energy? Understanding that men and women use energy differently, and then second, what is the energy that they use? If I were to make a, a gross, huge, sweeping statement, I would say that mechanical power and fuels are disproportionately important for men, for women, and that electricity is disproportionately important for men. And most of our development assistance, as I said, has focused on electricity. I have been myself in many, many places, many rural areas where women have actually cursed the day the electricity arrived in their house. Why? If the electricity is providing illumination or a radio, which is pretty much the first two things um, that poor households do, for the woman, all that has done is actually uh, lengthened her day because she still has to get up at five and go cart around that wood, come home, start the fire, boil the water, feed the kids, all the rest. Um, so now the expectation is that her day is just going to be longer. Before, when the sun went down, that was pretty much when your day ended. Um, now the day is extended. Um, for the man, one of the things that the electricity has provided is um, a radio and access to a soccer game. Now, I'm obviously generalizing, but from the places that I've been, this is the kind of feedback that you get. Um, uh, you know, access to communication and the radio and information, and in some cases the television, benefits everybody. But many women, if you're still without modern fuels and a more efficient way to cook, uh, access to low load electricity is not necessarily helping your day. Um, so which energy they use in terms of the source and then what does it produce and how much does that service cost? How is it delivered? And then what can men and women pay? Um, I think it's important to press the pause button here because one of the stereotypes in the energy debate is that poor people either cannot or do not pay for their energy. And that is factually untrue based on household um, income and expenditure surveys. The poorest people per kilowatt hour or per BTU pay more than people going up the income scale. Why? Because if you're getting your electricity from dry cell batteries, the per kilowatt cost of the dry cell battery compared to a modern grid connected electricity is much higher. And if you're getting your heat off of, um, you know, kerosene <laughs> rather than some other fuels, it's also per BTU much more expensive, and you're paying in smaller amounts. So it would be the same thing if you buy these little tiny packets of shampoo rather than a big bottle of shampoo. Per time you wash your hair, you're paying more. Um, that's pretty much the condition of the poorest people because they only have income in small amounts. But if you net it out, what they're paying in aggregate is actually more for a, a poorer level of energy services than people higher up the income scale. And um, in some countries, the total, well, one country in particular that we actually did some numbers on, Ethiopia, there was one year that Ethiopia imported more dry cell batteries than the entire installed capacity of electricity through the grid. So the idea that these are small amounts or marginal amounts of money is, is basically not true and that poor people um, are not willing to pay for energy is also untrue. Usually um, energy is the second largest expenditure among poor households um, after food because it's a necessity. You can't opt out of um, having energy. Um, the other thing, uh, so that I haven't left a wrong impression here, is that the condition of um, biomass or traditional fuel use does not only impact rural areas. The poorest people in urban areas, especially urban slums, basically have the same energy consumption patterns on the heat side of things as rural people. And certainly any place in sub-Saharan Africa, um, in the urban areas and in the slums especially, it is still basic wood and charcoal that people are cooking and heating on. So, and that's directly impacting scarcity in rural areas and, I mean, any place in sub-Saharan Africa. You just have these huge, huge trucks every day bringing in, you know, truckload after truckload of charcoal and wood to maintain um, urban energy consumption. So the idea that rural equals traditional energy and urban equals modern energy, that also isn't the case. Traditional energy is more income correlated than geography, geography correlated. And um, with the increases in urbanization in the poorest countries, this is uh, very rapidly shifting uh, some of the main energy problems as to how do you get um, more modern fuels such as kerosene and LPG into these urban areas at affordable cost. 
Okay, so to move from the theoretical to um, a practical um, project as one example of an intervention that looked at the difference between uh, male and female energy use, I wanted to talk a little bit about something called the Mali Multifunction Platform, which, um, again, is a devastatingly simple idea, which um, has been a very effective um, approach that started in the country of Mali, but it's now been extended to six West African countries, and the East Africans are trying to figure it out. Um, from an electricity point of view, there's many, many places that the grid is basically never going to reach. It will never be economic to have grid-connected electricity in some parts of Africa. Or you might need to wait another 25 years before it ever happens because the um, both public and private investment just isn't taking place. Yet people still need energy for their daily lives. Um, this particular um, project, which is now a program and beyond the country of Mali, started in the early um, 90s. Um, in the country of Mali to date, there are 400 of these platforms that are operational. Um, the failure rate has been less than 1% on this project, which is almost unheard of in development projects. So, uh, and I'll go on to talk a little bit about this. Each platform, and I'll show you a picture of a platform coming up, has about um, 800 clients per month. It's a business-based model that's based on fee-for-service. It's not an energy giveaway. It's not for benevolence. Um, it's to impact a social outcome, but it's run on a business model on a fee-for-service basis. And uh, these are some of the countries that the project has now expanded to. Um, this is a point that I've already made um, and was one of the reasons that um, the project was conceptualized was um, how to get more affordable energy services into rural areas in order to free up, essentially, female labor um, so that there would be more um, income-generating activities. Um, the hypothesis going in was that if uh, time were freed up uh, on, from women on some of the basic uh, energy issues, in this case, grinding um, and uh, pounding and pumping, not as much on the heat side of things, that there would be um, extra income generated from um, agriculture. And that was because in the places where these platforms operate, there's adequate land and women have access to land. So the outcomes that I'm going to describe would not necessarily occur in places that are, are land constrained or where people don't have access to land. Um, the multifunction platform provides access to reliable and affordable energy services. It's based on a fee-for-service model. Um, the organizational model is that um, the business is run by female cooperatives in these villages with, you know, accounting, money, um, clients, the whole thing. But in order to do it, there was um, upfront expenditure on client needs assessment and also on training basic literacy and numeracy so that we could be sure these businesses would, would be run with a business plan, with accounting, with month-end totals, and, you know, with an understanding of an income stream. Um, and although there have been certainly direct impacts on women and girls, which I'm going to talk about, men have also benefited from these platforms because the fee for service is for anybody who wants to pay the fee. Um, and one of the main benefits has been the um, increase in uh, income generating activities for both um, men and women. So this is what the multifunction platform looks like, and it's not any more complicated than a very basic Indian diesel generator um, mounted on a skid um, so that it can be moved around um, to different villages. It's obviously, um, what, sorry, when I say moved around, once it's in a village, it stays in the village. But to get it to the village, um, that's often a problem in a lot of these remote areas. It's very low tech. It can be maintained locally. Um, diesel is available because these villages are within access of roads and, you know, diesel is what's running the trucks. Uh, the each platform can be, uh, the appliances of the platform are tailored to the energy needs of the village based on a needs assessment. So this one, uh, for instance, uh, unfortunately there's not a, there's a saw, but beside the saw there's a welder, and this one um, has a battery charging. But you, you could also have it with two battery chargers and no saw, or with two dehuskers and no oil press. So what's attached to that platform can change based on the demand for services in the village. 
And the way it works is um, you come, you stand in line, and if you want to have a half an hour of grinding of maize, it costs X amount, and you pay X amount, and you get to grind, you get that for half an hour. Or you um, come and you recharge your battery, that costs X amount, you pay and your battery gets recharged. If you don't pay, you don't get the service. Um, One of the advantages of this approach has been um, the simplicity and the sturdiness of the technology. Now, um, I'll again press the pause button because I've presented this project enough that I'm sure there is somebody in the audience that's sitting there going, oh, diesel, bad, 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 diesel. Um, and I've certainly had um, some environmentalists say, well, why is the United Nations supporting an approach that uses diesel? The fact is, in these areas, diesel is commercially available. Um, it's cost effective, PV is not there, it is not commercially available, it is not cost effective, it cannot produce the load that these places um, need. There's no grid, the grid is never going to get to some of these places. Um, and so in a situation where your objective is to provide the energy service, you go with what is available and cost effective locally. Um, from a climate change point of view, the amount of emissions from places like these villages in Mali are just nothing just not even relevant on an aggregate level from a country perspective or frankly the whole sub-Saharan Africa from a climate change perspective. You could double, triple, ten times the energy consumption there and it would make no difference at all from a climate change perspective um, because the basic level of consumption of commercial energy is so low. So it's not that in, in the UN we are unfamiliar with this. In fact, most of our projects are dealing with renewable energy and some of the high emissions countries. But in places like these villages in West Africa um, with very high levels of um, poverty, so most of the people are people who live on less than a dollar a day um, and no access to commercial energy, this has been, in fact, the most cost effective way to go. Um, so, in order to get one of these platforms, it has to be requested. We don't kind of go in and give them away. We don't force any village. There's actually more demand for the platforms than there are ability to have the platforms. Um, each village that has it has to have gone through uh, this participatory pre-feasibility study to show that there is uh, actual cash income in the village and ability to pay so that the business model is going to be sustainable. Uh, the configuration of the platform depends on the needs and um, energy services required by that village. Uh, the ownership and management of the co-op that runs the platform is um, run by women. There is, um, on the grant side, so this would be um, in economic terms a subsidy, the training to build the capacity to run it is an upfront cost that the UN system pays. Um, each platform, sorry I should have said this earlier, each platform costs about $4,000. 2,000 of the dollars is cash money on the table from the village, okay? These are the poorest people in the world, less than a dollar a day, and they can come up with $2,000 cash from under the mattress or under wherever they keep it. Um, the other 2,000, that, which is the capital cost, comes as a grant from the UN, and the cooperative pays that back over time until they have fully paid the capital costs of the $4,000 platform. What is a grant is the capacity building on the training and the numeracy to make sure that the business model part works. Um, one of the benefits of this project is that we have um, actually spent a fair bit of money on making sure that we have the before, during, and after project statistics to be able to actually measure is it working or not. That's one of the uh, weaknesses of a lot of development assistance, that that money is often not spent. It's sort of seen as too expensive to spend it or a deviation away from the real project. But unless you spend the money on getting those statistics, you can't actually prove is the project being successful or cost effective. Um, this is what participatory rural assessment looks like because mostly you have people who are not literate um, and who if you go in and say, well, how much would you pay for A, B, or C? They've never thought about it because they never had the service. They never had the A, B, or C. And the ability to understand how much money would buy what is sort of hard. So I won't go into a lot of detail about this methodology, but it's basically a rank ordering process that you can ask people, would you pay more for this or for that? And if you had to choose A or B, would you choose A or B? And that's a way to get to actual real um, information on a rank ordering of priorities, um, desire to pay, 
And if you look on the income side, ability to pay. So you ask people, well, if you had this much money, which would you buy first? Um, this is labor intensive. It takes time and it takes people who are specialized in this methodology. It's not everybody that you can send in. Um, and it requires people that have um, a knowledge of the local languages, local customs, and um, specifically, it has also meant that you have to have female facilitators that can go do this because, again, lots of evidence that if a male facilitator goes in and asks these questions, the women may lie or um, try and be more rosy than the situation is the case because they're either unfamiliar in talking to men outside their village or they don't want to lose face or they think they should give an expected answer. So um, again, ha sourcing these projects with um, technical people of a particular gender is um, also important. Um, so of these 400 platforms, we have um, you know, village level um, information. One of the main things is uh, threshing and grinding agricultural products, but the other is um, shea nuts, which make shea butter, which you will find in your hand cream and stuff that you can go buy in the drugstore here, is one of the main um, products for sale that these villages make. Um, and it's very labor intensive to shell, grind, and then boil and rarefy this um, shea butter. And with the platform, they were able to get much higher quality product with a higher value added and for less time. So this is um, a graph showing the um, before and after um, amounts of time, the horizontal axis is minutes, and the amount of time saved. Um, and for people that are spending the kind of time I told you about um, doing basic um, grinding and uh, carrying activities, this is a lot of time. Um, the uh, amount of recovered shea butter and its value in the market at production. This is the before and after um, project information, which shows um, a very uh, market increase. And I'm hoping that, yeah, I'm going to have the income. This, this is the most significant one. Um, the difference in the income. Um, this is, um, as you can see, almost a tripling of income for people. And the um, amount would be like about 120 US dollars disposable additional income. If you're somebody who lives on less than a dollar a day, $120 is more money than you could ever conceive that you're gonna have. And what occurred in this place is that um, that money was, um, and we'll see from a slide coming up, was reinvested in children's education, in using health services, and the free time was used to put second, a second crop of rice in because now these women had time to go do agricultural activity on land that was available. And so the second income effect was, um, this is the income effect just from the shea butter sales, but there was a second income effect on selling agricultural surplus, which was the rice beyond what would be consumed at the family level. Um, in a development project context, this kind of income increase is really a very huge income increase, and um, it's sort of hard to emphasize that enough. Uh, the platforms can also be used for water pumping, but not all of the villages chose that because in the needs assessment, uh, food grinding was given a higher value and a higher willing to pay for that than water pumping. But um, the issue of um, a lot of the things I said earlier on about the impact that scarcity of energy has on women and girls is also true of water and water um, carrying. Um, so before the platform, um, this grinding, which is like a mortar and pestle that people stand around and do this, also that was something that girls had to do a lot of. We were able to measure the difference in the participation of girls and boys in school before and after the project. And then the interesting thing was the passing mark. Basically, you had less exhausted girls. You had girls who could stay awake in class. A, they could attend class, and B, they could stay awake and did better on their um, scores. So, I mean, the boys are outperforming the girls, but the difference in the girls' performance is, has been really much more dramatic than for the boys. Of course, boys also benefit it, um, so I don't want to leave the impression that, um, you know, this is disadvantaging um, men or boys. So, for instance, a lot of the platforms that had saws or welders, welding um, that you saw, um, the people who use that are men and boys because they're the ones doing carpentry, bicycle repair, et cetera. 
So men or women can pay the fee for service. Um, one of the things that happened was um, a lot of these villages, because the women started getting more disposable income, there was um, definitely a female empowerment that took place and a lot more um, female say in what was happening in village reinvestment and, and local politics. And this was something that did not, contrary to what some of you might worry about, um, provoke an adverse reaction in the men. Uh, the men were actually quite happy about it because having these women with more money in their households um, was pretty good deal for the men and they really like that and um, it hasn't created uh, some of the sometimes worried about anticipated um, negative social outcomes. Uh, the, ironically, the, the multifunction platform is referred to as the silent daughter-in-law in a lot of these villages which we find pretty hilarious because usually it's the daughter-in-law that you throw all the real grunt work at so now they can go to the platform and uh, just pay for it. So. That's one example. Um, if I were to choose another example and speak at length, which I will not do right now, um, another intervention that really makes a big difference in the lives of women and girls is um, commercially available LPG, propane or butane, in smaller canisters and stove technology that's affordable. Again, if you look at the variable costs of what poor families are paying on charcoal or wood, in many countries, and we're actually measuring this and have a number of projects doing this, you can show that the variable cost for wood or charcoal is the same or in some cases more than the variable cost of LPG. So the ability to pay is there. Why isn't the LPG sort of penetrating the market? Two of the barriers are the canister cost, the deposit on the canister, which is a one-off capital cost that um, quite often poor families can't afford to pay for. And the other is the stove technology. So even if the canister deposit is only $10 and even if the stove is only $8, that's $18 that a poor family is not going to have. And as income comes in small amounts, you can buy, you know, a piece, a bundle of wood this big every three days versus if the canister of LPG is too big, it means you would basically have to pay your, a month or a three month, in some cases, supply of energy all at one go. And poor families never have all that money at one time. So also that having credit systems that you could prorate the repayment for um, LPG is proving to be um, one of the real challenges. Now, I'm mentioning this because just as um, the people that want to sell washing machines or cars or televisions also sell financing, um, until we can get the gas companies to also sell financing, you're actually not going to be able to penetrate uh, some of the markets that exist in these areas because of that inability to pay in... Um, aggregated time amounts. Um, and that's something that in uh, six countries right now, UNDP is working with some of the oil and gas majors about looking at how to um, increase the consumption of LPG um, in order to look at the heat side of things. But um, that would just be another example I would make. So there's now a series of slides which I'll just rapidly go through on what do we think are some pro-women or gender important energy policies. And certainly those would be policies that support the services that women use. And as I've tried to emphasize, some of the services that are very important for women are those related to mechanical power and heat. Most energy policy, not only in our countries, but certainly in all developing countries, pretty much just focuses on electricity. And there's either no policies in place for the use of biomass or there are um, policies related to fuels that actually disadvantage um, LPG or kerosene. Uh, through perverse taxation um, or import limitations. Um, policies to support electricity for illumination are important when the illumination is in public places, in schools, or in clinics. Less important when it's in, in the household from the point of view of a gender consideration. The public safety issue is a really, really big deal um, in uh, urban areas, especially slums. Basically, women and girls can't go out after dark in these areas because of their personal safety. And there are um, places where municipal governments are actually finding that it's cheaper to put in place the illumination than the policing um, in order to deal with crime and uh, personal violence. Uh, policies that support the availability of mechanical power and electricity for end using um, and labor saving devices these are, um, as I've tried to emphasize, particularly important for mechanical power applications. Again, low load electricity, that's a couple of watts, um, won't do anything to deal with the mechanical power situation. 
So that's one of the limitations of some of the interventions with uh, decentralized renewable energy systems. Unless you can get a high enough load to support mechanical power, it's hard to get some of the income effects. Uh, policies to support the availability of cleaner fuels um, and the appliances that go with cleaner fuels are important and that's certainly uh, the case related to kerosene and LPG. Policies that support technology development and dissemination for applications where women are most active is really important. So that means uh, for commercial food vending, kilns, stoves, that look at the types of economic activities that women are involved in. So again, in a lot of places, uh, whether it's metal casting, tile making, beer brewing, commercial food vending, many of those activities are activities where the economic entrepreneurs are mostly women. Yet the technology development hasn't necessarily engaged with them as the client or the business managers. Um, and there are lots of sad stories about um, presses, pumps, and various technologies that are engineered as gender neutral, but then you find out if you are, you know, a four foot ten woman, you actually can't use the pump because it's engineered for somebody that's 5'10". But nobody actually considered that the client who's going to use it, or the press, or the mortar and pestle system, uh, is um, physically just different than a man. Uh, policies that support um, energy service financing are particularly important and especially trying to link uh, the energy and the rural energy community to the microcredit community is a very big deal. These two communities hardly talk to each other right now. And issues looking at um, targeted lending for energy services and energy products are particularly important for women. Um, Basic issues related to uh, numeracy, literacy, business management, the ability to make business plans, very important. The Mali um, project shows um, that women actually uh, can be important not only as beneficiaries, but actually can be very important energy entrepreneurs. And the um, example of cell phones and battery recharging are sort of other areas where women are specializing. And I could talk a bit more if anybody's interested about some South Asian examples there. Uh, one of the things that um, is important is um, just getting, this uh, seems obvious but is deadly unobvious when you're in developing countries, is actually getting the issue that men and women use energy differently and are different as consumers into the energy policy discussion is a, is a very steep hill to climb, um, but is very important if you want to influence the outcomes. So, I mean, if your goal is to um, have the take up of more modern fuels. If you only market to men and women are the people who use the fuels, um, probably you're not going to achieve your objective. This um, final slide on policies is uh, one of the biggest deals. In a lot of countries, forget what you would do in the energy sector. If women lack basic legal status as a human being, that you don't have an ID, you're not, you don't exist as a person, um, you don't have a legal right to own land or own property or open a bank account because you don't have any ID. That really limits what you can do in energy and, in fact, in any kind of commercial transaction. And this is, unfortunately, still the case um, for a lot of women in some of the poorest countries, that their basic legal status as a person um, doesn't exist under local law. Um, the second name that's up on this slide, Sheila Oparacha, she is the coordinator for Energia. Energia is a global network of uh, gender and energy practitioners um, who we've worked with in producing this toolkit. Uh, I've talked about some of the policy level interventions. The toolkit goes through on a project level how to incorporate <laughs> gender and energy concerns either in energy projects or in gender projects. I think it's important to say as the UN, we are not proposing that you need to only have standalone gender and energy projects. Quite the reverse, is that when you approach energy projects and energy programs, you have to take into consideration just the differences between men and women and their role in the energy supply chain and make sure that the project design explicitly acknowledges that. And the before project design, when you measure who spends what on energy, that you have to know is it men or women? Is it the same? Is it different? Which, which services and which sources? So that list of uh, seven questions I had earlier. And uh, Laurent Koch, who's there, he's the uh, manager of the multifunction platform. So if anybody's particularly interested in that, there's more in, in information there. That's what the toolkit looks like. It's available on our website. And um, I've left a, c a couple of copies here. And uh, from a UNDP point of view, <coughs> 
this really matters from a human being point of view. 1.6 million people dying every year um, is really a big deal. Um, and this is sort of the face of the people who are very impacted by this. So that would be my last word on that and um, try and leave myself open to any questions. We have time for a few questions. Um, obviously, in this discussion, I've spent time talking about gender and energy, but UNDP works on energy at large. We work on renewable energy. Um, we work on, in all five um, geographic areas, and um, we work on small grants. Uh, we're one of the implementing agencies under the Global Environment Facility, and we also do work on the clean development mechanism. So there's a range of energy activities, um, both uh, conventional energy, like some of the LPG work that I talked about, and renewable energy as financed under the GEF. Can you uh, address this in your uh, presentation? Can we send you an email and ask you to send us? The presentation will actually be posted on our Baker Institute oh, Energy Baker website. Institute. Okay. It will be posted right after. Yeah. And the webcast will be available as well. I have a question about the difference between um, what you would do with diesel fuel to heat a home or provide cooking versus having electricity provide that same service, because you made this distinction between the two. Is it, is it a cost basis? Is it appliance oriented? Because we think of electricity as being the thing that heats of, you know, like you plug in your stove or, you right. know. Just um, from a, sort of an engineering point of view, to get a unit of heat from electricity versus from a fuel, the efficiency is just different and you have to have really cheap electricity provide it pretty efficiently in order to make it competitive. And the transmission and distribution losses in most of these countries yes, would mean but that you're just never going to get like, I mean, I don't know what you call it, distributed services. In other words, we're, we're going to have a village and we're going to have something that's going to generate electricity. It's still the same thing? <clears throat> well, you can have something that generates electricity in a distributed system, whether it's you know, a mini grid, yeah. diesel, wind, PV, whatever. But that electricity is probably not going to meet the heat-related needs of the village from whatever source, just because of the efficiency and the conversion factor. So the whole fuel side of things, whether it's in traditional fuels, biofuels, LPG, kerosene, or more efficient appliances to use the fuels, because those are the two sides of the heat equation. Um, unless you focus on them, all the electricity in the world isn't going to change the head loading of wood type of behavior. Um, and that, that, that those two things are not interchangeable doesn't really, hasn't influenced the energy debate within development as much as it needs to. It's sort of taken for granted, oh, well, if you had electricity, they wouldn't be head-loading wood. If you had electricity, they'll still be head-loading wood. If they don't have fuels, um, that's what's going to impact wood. I think two, two, two things I want to comment, and that is that this is the most down-to-earth, uh, intriguing uh, presentation I've heard in a long time. I was particularly, uh, at least for me, uh, it was an eye-opener that, you know, heat trumps light. And, uh, <laughs> And the needs of the, of the poorest of the poor. And in the expenditure, I should have said that. If you look at family expenditure on heat versus uh, dry cell batteries, it's an 80-20 split. 80% on heat related or f fuels. I, sh I should better use fuels because kerosene is included in 80 versus um, things for electricity. But sorry. The, 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 other, the, other, the question I've got though is, you know, you've got to get that, you've got to get the fuel, whether it's diesel or, or, or propane or butane. Mm -hmm from some point where it exists to your platforms or, or whatever, in your scheme is, the, you know, who owns that distribution network? Is that too owned by the women that are the micro borrowers, if you will, or is that owned by another distribution entity? And, and how does that, I mean, how does that fit in, their, in the value chain? Because that, that's gotta get right. to where it needs to be. Mm -hmm. In the countries here, it's completely not the women, not the villages. These people are mostly outside of the formal sector. So, you know, you still have to have the refinery, the roads, the trucks, and whether it's an international company like Shell, BP, Exxon, whoever, or a domestic company like Ghana, Goyle, the state um, oil company, 
this, the front end of the supply chain, which requires larger capital investment, is pretty much going to be done by the known players because they're the only ones that will have access to capital in sufficient amounts. So that, that kind of Mali multifunction platform only works if there is diesel in the country. Um, my point was is that even in the poorest countries, you're always going to find diesel because that's the only thing anybody's going to run trucks off of. Whereas uh, you might not find um, <coughs> some of the more modern electricity <coughs> generating devices. In any country, you're going to find those kind of crappy Indian diesel generators. So the low tech is relevant because it's there, it exists. One of the difficulties with some modern, uh, cleaner, higher tech, and frankly better technology is in those kind of villages. Nobody can install it, nobody can maintain it. They strip out all the safety devices. Birds come and poop on the PV panels, and nobody realizes that's why the P PV panels won't work. I mean, stuff as simple as that, that you should say, well, but, you know, it's better technology. It should work. Well, it should, but, you know, if nobody knows how to fix the thing, yeah. it means after the foreigners go home, that's it. It's not working. Thanks. Um, I understand you're coming from the perspective of the UNDP, but um, are other international organizations taking a gendered look at energy um, and how are they doing so differently, or maybe the same way? Yeah. Um, well, the sad truth is uh, most development assistance has not heavily focused on the gender, including our own, including UNDP. Um, so uh, all of the foreign aid agencies are being asked to mainstream gender to make it something that's not a standalone, like don't have a standalone gender in water or gender in energy. But how to mainstream gender into an energy project or a transport project or a credit project, a lot of people just either don't know how to do it or have never thought about it. So things like this little toolkit, which is a, frankly a pretty humble, straightforward thing, is already a big deal because um, a lot of, I mean, when I was in China or Guatemala or Peru or different places, I mean, you'll get people that they'll fly in to formulate a project. Um, they have just never thought about disaggregating the project design by consumer. They just think, well, consumers are consumers. The fact that consumers are men and women, people, different, it, um, from a kind of engineering or technology point of view, the skill set of the people who design the projects quite often hasn't included this. Um, <coughs> on the other side, people who are gender specialists quite often have lacked the technical skills to design energy projects. So it's sort of the two communities haven't come together. Um, the World Bank is um, you know, trying to work on this, and there's certainly people in the World Bank that work on it, but um, from if you're at the upper end of the supply chain, then you would say, oh, but it's, it's neutral, it's gender neutral. Um, one of the, among the bilateral donors who have worked most extensively on this would um, be certainly Sweden and the Netherlands. And Germany has worked a lot on um, more efficient stoves and smoke-free stoves and uh, just generally stove technology. Thank you. <coughs> Actually, a two-part question. The first one concerns the dry cells whether you have any statistics about what do the service they actually provide and whether there's a gender component to that service. And the second <coughs> is a, if you would comment a little bit about solar ovens and what they're having useful. Oh, solar ovens is a, a difficult one. Um, the dry cells, uh, uh, like the International Energy Agency, is starting to track that because when we started to look at the aggregate numbers, our heads were exploding when we were realizing that the total, the total import of dry cell batteries compared to installed capacity is just sort of mind-blowing in some of the poorest countries. So the IEA does track those, the International Energy Agency based in Paris is starting to track that. Um, the, the gender disaggregation I don't think would play itself out as much on the dry cells. It's mostly um, used for um, illumination for um, lanterns, uh, also um, batteries to run um, radios and televisions. Um, you know, it's a debate about what's the benefit of a television, but you know, people would certainly say, well, anybody, including a poor person, man or woman, if they want entertainment, why shouldn't they have it? Um, and the other is uh, telephone uh, charging is is really a big deal for batteries now because a lot of the poorest countries are never going to have that, you know, they're going to jump past a wire-based uh, telephone system straight to a cell-based system. So 
a lot of these places you can go into rural areas and you know people walking around with cell phones and and charging the cell phones if you have cell phones but you don't have a grid you still have to charge the cell phone somehow so that's um one of the sort of <coughs> new new uses of uh, imported dry cells uh, solar ovens sorry solar ovens is a complicated one so i will start by saying i have a bias based on what i've seen or studied or looked at um, after 25 years of solar oven work, they have not taken off, they are not in wide use, and why? Well, there's some design elements re related to understanding what your consumer needs and what's their life like. If you need to have um, cooked food in the morning before you go and do eight hours of agricultural work, having a solar cooker that's going to produce cooked food at the end of the day doesn't match with the consumption pattern of the household. So that's been one problem with solar cookers. A second is, if the solar cooker needs to be attended by somebody, needs to, somebody needs to sit and watch it so that nobody steals your food, that's one less person that's gonna be out doing agricultural work. And in some cases, the same kid that you would withdraw from school to go fetch wood is now just gonna sit beside a solar cooker. Uh, some of the solar cooker successes have been on institutional applications. So for caf cafeterias or commissaries in uh, uh, clinics, schools, you know, beyond the family level, at the, at the individual household family, uh, there hasn't been as much success as one would hope. And then some of the, um, but this would just be at the level of anecdotal, um, some of the complaints from users is that the food doesn't taste right or doesn't smell right, because if you're used to having the smoky, if you think your food, your lentils or your rice or whatever it is, has to have that smoky smell or taste to be the right kind of food, and you're not going to get that off of solar. Um, somebody needs to engineer how to inject the smoke taste into <laughs> the, the solar cookers. Um, and then the other is, um, the, and I, believe me, I'm, I'm worrying about this answer because I've had years of debates with some solar cooker people who really don't like to hear any of this from me. Um, you know, if it's, if it's $12, they'll say, but it's only $12. If you're a poor family, you're never going to have $12 for a solar cooker. And if it's $40, well, forget it. You might as well say, you know, do you want a Porsche? So, you know, unless it really gets down to sort of, you know, the 2 $3 technology, um, if your option is three stones and, it, and your girl child walking five hours versus $12, you're going to pick three stones and your kid walking five hours. So some of it is just the conditions of poverty, unless you can, you know, get up to a certain level. Um, and then the argument is, well, why not give them away? Well, there's almost no development interventions that are su sustainable on a giveaway. Unless you can commercialize the technology, then um, not so sustainable. But the success stories are in, in <coughs> institutional applications, not so much in household applications. Time for one more question. Yeah, I was also surprised at your number about the heat versus electricity. Yeah. Uh, because you often do see pictures of women carrying water on their heads as well. Yeah. Um, is there any data that tells us how much time women spend, say, uh, looking for firewood versus carrying, carrying water? Well, it'll depend on the scarcity of the, the raw material in the place, but it, it's comparable. The hours of time are comparable. In a lot of places, it's like three to five hours a day. The labor is pretty much always female. And the energy link to the water is sometimes it's because you don't have mechanical power for pumping. It's not that, you know, there's no water underground. It's that there's no pumping technology um, to move it around. So that's also why the platforms in some cases um, do water pumping. Um, that's why I would have thought electricity would be very helpful because at least it may not solve the heat problem, but it would certainly reduce the time. On the, on the water side, yes. Um, if you have the investment to, you know, bore the wells and all the rest. UNICEF has worked a lot on water and water pumping. And I think also one of the, um, on the renewable energy sides, one of the things that, um, you know, despite any of my negative comments about solar PV, uh, s uh, solar water pumping actually has got a definite niche for off-grid applications. So um, I think that's something that's definitely worth looking at. Thank you, Susan, and I hope you